All righty. Um, welcome to the Adaptive Climbing Clinic put on by the Outdoor Recreation Center, um, part of the University Recreation uh, Department at Washington State University. Um, as Andrea said, uh, this is Matt and I'm Carson. You'll see James on my name there. It's my first name. I go by my middle name, Carson. Um, so I'm a, one of the adventure facilitators for the Outdoor Recreation Center. So I lead trips. I'm pretty new to climbing. I started when I got the job. Um, so I've done mostly indoor stuff, but I've done a little bit of sport climbing outside. Nice. And uh, yeah, my name is Matt. Um, I coordinate the outdoor programs, all the outdoor trips. I used to coordinate the climbing wall um back um handed that off back in 2016 but between 2013 and 2016 i coordinated uh the climbing wall uh, at urec um i'm a professional climbing instructors association the pcia top managed climbing instructor i've been climbing um on and off for the most part since uh 2005 so yeah um, Alrighty, so um, if we want to go around and introduce ourselves, maybe with our major and our job, like Matt and I have done, um, uh, and experience in climbing, what you're hoping to get out of the clinic, et cetera, things up on the slide. Um, let's see. Oh, and uh, sorry, uh, my pronouns, uh, he, him, his, for me. Yep, also he, him, his. All right, so we're gonna go over a number of things in this presentation. We're gonna um, give a little background on climbing and adaptive recreation. We're going to talk about types of climbing. We're gonna talk about uh, access considerations, um, having the right equipment, safety, et cetera. Um, oh, uh, opportunities through the ORC and opportunities through other organizations as well. So, oh, uh, Kenny replied, great. Um, Kenny is a senior ISC major, no climbing experience, um, but interested in learning more. Sweet, glad to have you. All right. Um, so for all programs we have with the Outdoor Recreation Center, we have essential eligibility criteria. So criteria that everyone has to meet before being involved in the program. Um, and it's, it's about safety. It's about making sure everyone's prepared for the program. Uh, so we'll have um, different kinds of criteria depending on the program, um, but there's gonna be some basic criteria that apply to all programs. Uh, they generally re uh, relate to safety and, and judgment, um, behaving well and contributing as part of the group and addressing personal needs while you're in the program. Um, and the purpose of the essential eligibility criteria is to manage risk and safety. It's not to scare people away. It's not to try to keep people out. It's trying to make sure that everyone who's involved, knows what they're getting into, and um, is going to be able to perform safely. Um, we use them. Lots of organizations, other organizations use them. So um, they're an important part of running a, a safe and fun program. Matt, do you have anything you want to add in there? Um, yeah. Um, as far as um, uh, some examples, like REI, uh, has examples that you can find on their website uh, as far as like an example of like a major uh, nationwide program that has essential eligibility criteria but also uh, you can find those on our website if you just go to um, our outdoor programs part of the UREC website and under trips and clinics the essential eligibility criteria are right there on the trips page um, you have to scroll down in order to see all the trips that we offer and you have to scroll right past them. And there are a number, 
we don't list everything outright, but there are links uh, to those essential eligibility criteria. Um, but uh, if you have any questions, concerns about those, uh, feel free to reach out to us and our contact information is on the website um, as well. Um, yeah, yeah, that's all I had. Great. Great. Um, and so I'm gonna get out in, into the uh, sort of intro to adaptive climbing and kind of like go over some uh, definitions, uh, kind of go over like what our background is in adaptive climbing. Um, and we'll probably mention it again, we're kind of new to adaptive climbing. Uh, we just received our training. Uh, we're gonna mention adaptive adventures and paradox sports. We just got our training through those two organizations in conjunction with each other. Uh, about, um, it wasn't this past October, but the October before, October of 2018. So we're new to this. Um, and we're trying to like, trying to like get our programs going. Uh, we've learned a lot and we're already ready to share. Um, but kind of get us started. Adaptive recreation, the de definition, it's a recreational activity that has been created or modified to allow someone with a disability the opportunity to participate. Um, <clears throat> adaptive equipment is equipment that has been designed or modified uh, to allow an individual with, with a disability to participate. Uh, inclusive recreation, um, providing access for individuals with a disability to participate in already existing program and services alongside individuals who may not have a disability. Um, if you have any questions as far as those definitions go, um, let us know. Um, but uh, let's see, those are our definitions, adaptive adventures. Um, so our training was through adaptive adventures uh, and paradox sports. Um, adaptive adventures was founded in 99 by two individuals uh, who just kind of wanted to get out there and start doing uh, either competitive or uh, outdoor adaptive sports. They've served over 100,000 people and their families from all 50 states. Um, and they've been providing online programs, camps, um, clinics in cycling, climbing, kayaking, paddle boarding, a lot of stuff. Um, scuba, rafting, dragon boat racing. I don't know if anyone's um, familiar with dragon boat racing, uh, but my hometown has actually started to do that. It's these big long boats uh, that actually like are decorated to look like dragons. And it's basically a race with a bunch of those like along a course, um, worth looking into for sure. And Paradox Sports is um, basically an adaptive, like climbing specific uh, adaptive programs uh, with both indoor and outside climbing. All right, so we'll go ahead and we'll watch a brief video. Well, um, I'm really sorry that the audio doesn't work on that. Uh, yeah. Uh, Carson, if you could share the link to the video in the chat. Uh, really fun video um, to just kind of show what adaptive climbing is all about. It's actually uh, takes place in my home state of Kentucky. I don't know if y'all can notice my accent, but um, yeah, I'm really sorry the video didn't work, but uh, we'll just kind of go along without it. Um, sorry about that, y'all. Wait. Alrighty. So there's a number of reasons why somebody might want to choose to do rock climbing. And one of them is that recreating at height involves a lot of attention. It takes your entire focus um, as it should. And so that can give you a brain break or help you enter a flow state. It can let you, you know, leave behind concerns that you have at school or work um, and just kind of focus on the task at hand. Um, and you might find yourself entering a flow state 
which is uh, a state of, of conscious attention where you're totally focused on a task, um, kind of marked by uh, feeling less uh, self-conscious, feeling of control, finding the task enjoyable. Uh, and it occurs when you're, uh, when the challenge ahead of you is kind of at parity with your ability. So when your ability matches the challenge, you can enter a flow state. So even though I'm not a particularly experienced climber, when I'm say climbing in the gym at WSU, I can still achieve a flow state because I'm working on uh, a route that is, you know, matches my ability level. Um, it's not only a physical challenge. It, climbing is not only a physical challenge. It's also a mental challenge. Um, before you start climbing, you have to puzzle out how you're going to complete the route, where you want to, um, what you want your holds to be, um, how exactly you're going to maneuver up. Um, and then when you get to the top, there's a great feeling of accomplishment. Um, and over time you develop skills and abilities, um, that you, you know, might not have had before. So, uh, there's all great reasons to be involved in climbing and those apply, um, whether, you know, at whatever level of climbing, uh, you're, you're participating in. So there's a number of types of climbing. Um, the most common are listed here. We have bouldering, which can be done outside or in the gym. Bouldering is uh, climbing without ropes or hardware. Um, you just have your shoes and your hands. And um, you, you, keep, you keep it at a pretty low height so that if you fall, it is not a particularly dangerous fall. Uh, you use pads to break your falls if you need. Um, and so it's just like, you're right there, you hop up on the rock, you're bouldering. Um, top rope is something you might encounter in the gym. Uh, and that's where, you know, you're in your harness and there's a rope and you maybe have a belayer or an auto belay. Um, and you are ascending a large, uh, a lengthy, a lengthy climb. Uh, sport climbing is a lot like top rope, but it's outside. So, um, a good example of sport climbing around here is at Granite Point. You can go up to the top and hook up, you can walk up to the top, hook up your, um, your, your rope and your anchors, and then you can go back down and then climb from there. Uh, with, and so that's, that's the kind of outdoor climbing. Another type of outdoor climbing is traditional climbing where instead of having a top rope, you are bringing harder with you called protection and you're placing that in the rock as you go up. Um, so then if you fall, you're not anchored into a top rope. You are falling to your last piece of hardware. Um, aid climbing takes the similar kind of hardware used in traditional climbing, but you use it to climb. It's necessary for making forward progress on the wall. Um, unlike traditional climbing where it's just safety equipment. In aid climbing, your hardware is needed to advance. Um, ice climbing is going to be climbing done on ice faces like say a frozen waterfall. Uh, and it uses some different equipment, um, notably ice tools, which are spiky looking, they look kind of like ice axes, but they have a different angle and they have different um, traction on them, a different edge. And you use those instead of finding individual holds with your hands, your ice tools help you hold the, they're your holds on the ice. And then you also have crampons, which are like spikes for your boots that are the holds for your feet. And then Finally, mountaineering is, um, might use all kinds of climbing skills, um, but it's, the goal is summiting a mountain. Um, so you might say, have an ice climbing stretch on a mountaineering trip. Um, and so instead of, it, it might use all kinds of skills along the way. Matt, do you have anything else you want to add there? Uh, yeah, uh, as far as yeah, the mountaineering, alpine, and alpinism, that's basically just a 
uh, accumulation of all of those different types of, of disciplines within the sport of climbing. Um, but yeah, that's whenever it, all of the skills come together um, to, to climb a mountain. Yeah, or at least a big wall. Neat. Okay, as far as um, when it comes to adaptive climbing, how we fit equipment, uh, there's just like some general principles of, of outfitting someone uh, with adaptive equipment. Uh, you gotta think about, um, you gotta think about like, this is a recreational activity. It's a fun thing that we're trying to get people to do. Um, you wanna make sure that the person climbing is reasonably comfortable. Yeah, like they're going to be physically challenged through climbing, but you wanna make sure that there's not like any uh, too much like abrasion that their harness and all their like, all their equipment that they're using, which sometimes it's more equipment uh, than is typically needed for climbing. Uh, you wanna make sure all of that is comfortable for them. Um, you wanna make sure that you know how to fit the equipment uh, in a timely manner because you don't want to go <sighs> to a climbing area or show up to a gym for a four hour um, climbing session and spend 90 minutes to two hours trying to fit the equipment. Make sure like we want to know the equipment uh, before um, going on. So that just takes practice. Uh, we definitely spend time uh, with staff like practicing just fitting the equipment like everyone like having everyone that helps out with these programs uh, fit the harness and not, not just one time maybe fit the harness multiple times and take turns outfitting each other um, make sure that you're like we want it to be fun low stress um, and we also want to make sure that our equipment uh, that you're using, like, again, like you need to know how to use the equipment, make sure you get properly trained and educated on how to use it. So your systems and stuff that you build look nice and neat and organized because even if your equipment is set up well and correctly, but it looks unorganized and the ropes look all tangled and stuff, uh, that's going to affect the confidence in the participants um, and like basically the confidence in uh, the people that you're climbing with. So you want to make sure that all of your systems are not only set up well, that they look good. Um, and as far as um, try to have like a, um, you know, your hand on the, on the pulse of like everyone's physical uh, not just physical safety, but also emotional safety. Uh, we definitely want to push people um, outside of their comfort zone a little bit, uh, but we don't want to push them so far to where they're not, that it, it ruins the experience for them. Um, let's see, uh, three key considerations. Um, yeah, we talked about physical comfort. Uh, we want to make sure that they feel supported by the equipment. And we're gonna talk about specifics of the equipment uh, here in later slides. Uh, we wanna make sure that there's proper cushioning, uh, that there's no, um, a, like too much abrasion, that the skin is protected. Um, a lot of folks that uh, participate in adaptive climbing, um, skin abrasion can actually cause some very serious um, uh, medical conditions uh, because of their ability to manage like a wound that might develop because of like a scratch or something. So we want to be really mindful of protecting the skin and cushioning wherever it's needed. Um, system redundancy, uh, we want to make sure that like a lot of people, um, you know, whenever you think about backups for your backups for your backups, you think about like NASA and like the space program and making sure that, you know, there's safety systems on top of our safety systems. 
uh, that's kind of how we build um, climbing systems. Uh, whenever we're, you know, putting together a top rope and we're building our anchor at the top to like thread a rope through to climb on the whole day, we want to make sure that mo like even if a part of that system fails, there is a um, there is a system in place for um, for basically that failure to be caught um, and uh, that <clears throat> two or three or even four levels of failure would have to happen in your system for it to like actually completely fail. Um, and you're also building a nice strong system that whenever we build our top ropes, um, they can not only hold up a climber or three or four climbers, but they could probably hold like a semi truck up. Um, that there's, we want to make sure that there's no question in the strength and redundancy of our systems. Um, sweet. Well, so, um, as far as adaptive climbing at WSU, uh, with the equipment, we're just trying to create ability. Um, Create that seating and stability and uh, with the equipment that we have those climbing adaptations. We have an easy seat harness, uh, we have a hull system with pulleys and a horizontal grip ascender, um, also called like a bicycle uh, grip ascender. Uh, we have grip assists that are called active hands. As far as facilities and programs, we have a climbing wall and challenge course. We also do we do some uh, outside climbing, but right now, as far as our adaptive climbing, we're trying to kind of get things started at the climbing wall. And then I think after that, we're going to be moving, uh, hopefully eventually to outside climbing and doing some adaptive climbing outside. Um, but we're gonna get into specifics as far as uh, the equipment here in later slides. Uh, the Easy Seat Harness, uh, created by Misty Mountain. Uh, it's basically, um, it's very, like, it is a, it's not just a seat um, and a harness. Like, it's a, it's a harness in and of itself. You don't need a harness and then, like, this seat on top of it. Uh, it's a harness um, with a sort of, like, integrated seat. I don't know if, like, y'all are familiar with those foldable stadium seats or like a Crazy Creek chair, uh, but it's kind of similar to that and that's kind of what it looks like. Um, it's, um, yeah, some a unique combination of seat and a chest harness, um, single point attachment, um, yeah, a lot greater support and security than a traditional um, harness that you would use for climbing. Uh, sometimes they're uh, they're used for adaptive climbing. They're also used for some challenge courses uh, and ro high ropes courses uh, because they're really comfortable. Uh, they kind of reduce pressure on uh, the legs and sort of the hips and just provide a nice little seat to where you can sit down. Uh, it's really comfortable to, to be in. Um, and a lot of times like with adaptive climbing and uh, challenge courses and ropes courses, a lot of times you're in the harness for a long time. Uh, and if you're those extended time hanging situations, makes things a lot more comfortable. Um, yeah. Okay. And then we have a, um, basically, I don't want to get too much into the uh, the the technical side of things as far as like the hull system and how it's put together because um, we would we could put on a probably a two hour clinic just on how to set those up. There are some uh, YouTube videos that you can check out that you can just kind of be exposed to how the, these are set up. Um, but I just kind of want to talk about them in brief. So our hull system is set up to where you can use one of these handlebar ascenders. If for some reason someone can't uh, climb on the actual rock or the climbing wall, uh, one option that, 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 that they have uh, with this hull system is we can set it up and they can either pull themselves up off the ground with a rope and they can like, we can reduce basically the amount of 
um, effort involved in pulling yourself up off the ground uh, by either using the rope or using this handlebar ascender over here to the left, where you can actually, uh, we attach that to the rope and you can, by gripping it like this, you can actually move it up the rope and then pull yourself up. Uh, and that's a great way to, uh, first of all, it's a great exercise and great way to get off the ground without like having to like use the the climbing holds um and uh if you look over here to the right you can see some of the system redundancy you see at the top we have two different anchors that uh the system is built through uh we have a belayer and a belayer uh is is someone who is they're attaching their, their rope to the climber and taking in slack as they ascend, as they get higher. Uh, and they're basically managing the slack and the rope just in case like they fall or like either begin to fall or uh, maybe uh, for whatever reason that system um, fails, then they are on that rope of their belayer and then they get caught. Uh, the other anchor that it's built through um, is where we hook up the actual haul system uh, to where that person is. Basically, if, if you've heard of a Z pulley or a three to one haul system, and you can build it up to like five to one, nine to one, you can go all the way up to 12 to one. And basically, um, it greatly reduces the energy involved uh, energy required to haul yourself up. Uh, does anyone have any questions as far as the haul system um, and the handlebar ascender? Alrighty, so we just saw the handlebar ascender and you, uh, another device that can help someone use the handlebar ascender is what's called a grip assist. So our example here is made by a company called Active Hands. And their, their gripping aids, uh, they're not gonna help somebody grab the wall, but they're gonna help somebody grab something in their hands. Um, they're used for weightlifting, they're used for all kinds of things. So in, in an adaptive climbing system, they'd be used for that ascender bar. Um, and they work kind of like a glove that secures very tightly around, or not tightly, but securely around the wrist, and then a strap goes over the fingers and attaches down at the wrist again. And so the hand is held in this grip position um, and that'll help somebody hold on to a bar, for example. Um, and they're very adjustable so they can be fit to the climber. Um, and uh, yeah, so does anybody have questions about grip assists? can find YouTube videos on them if you want, you know, more detail. All right, cool. All and also these aren't the only uh, grip aids, but these are the one that were, ones that were recommended to us by Adaptive Adventures and Paddle, or in Paradox Sports, and they work great. And they're actually like, they're really well padded and very comfortable and really effective at providing that grip assist. Uh, but there are some, you know, different brands and different, and actually Active Hands makes different types of gripping aids, uh, but these are the, the general purpose ones. On. All right. Um, so basically you've seen what uh, UREC currently has, uh, but uh, just kind of wanted to share what other adaptive equipment there is out there. And usually this stuff uh, is um, because um, it's not like a mass marketed thing. Uh, usually they, these are made to order. So uh, usually if you were wanting to purchase these, you go to Misty Mountain, their website, and also Misty Mountain and also Evolve and like basically put in an order and then usually you'll get it within three or four weeks. Um, 
but yeah, so it takes a little bit for them to put each one of these together. Um, so the top left portion, portion that you're seeing is called the uh, Misty Mountain Wellman Chaps. And basically um, it is a, a seat harness that includes uh, some heavy um, padding and abrasion resistance for the sides. So just like a pair of like riding chaps or like motorcycle chaps, they're going to protect the legs for those who are um, those climbers who are wanting to um, or, or need um, abrasion resistance for whenever they move up the wall. If they're going to, it's called canvassing. Uh, canvassing is when you just use your hands in order to move up uh, the climbing wall or the climbing surface. And that means your feet and legs aren't doing any work, but they may be dragging along the wall surface or the rock surface. And so this provides that protection on the legs. Um, you know, a lot of times like folks think like, oh, like a, a pair of like thick pants, like a pair of Carhartts uh, would be enough. Uh, but um, when it comes to like the hard plastic of climbing holds and also um, the, I mean, the rock surface, uh, this would prevent a lot of the bruising and stuff like that that would happen. I think those pads on those Wellman chaps are probably at least a couple inches thick. So this provides like a lot of comfort. Um, <clears throat> the arc spreader uh, that you'll see over to the right hand side um, is basically uh, provides additional stability uh, if you're using one of the easy seats. Um, sometimes folks need additional stability uh, on top of the having the easy seat uh, because they have um, maybe like they don't have the ability to in their torso to hold their uh, torso up and to maintain balance and so this provides that stability above them and you can see how it's applied uh, below like you see like the detail of the easy of the arc spreader and then you see it applied to the easy seat below uh, and just provides that additional stability so the, there's less of the sway if they need it. Um, and the last, um, hopefully we're going to eventually get the adaptive foot and uh, shoe that goes a, a, along with it. But this um, Evolve makes, it's, it's an adaptive foot that, um, so for those with uh, prosthetics, um, you, the connection uh, is universal for most things, like for, um, for the ends of the prosthetic is, is pretty universal. And so you could buy this adaptive foot and put this shoe on it. I hear the shoe is really hard to get onto it because it's so tight, um, but you could actually provide someone um, who has a prosthetic with the sticky rubber of a climbing shoe, uh, which makes a big difference uh, when you're climbing rock or climbing indoors. Um, any questions as far as this equipment goes? It's a lot, there's a lot to take in. Uh, but hopefully, uh, right now we're kind of, uh, there's, you know, always, not always, but oftentimes budget constraints. Um, and this stuff is unfortunately like not very cheap. And so right now I think we basically have a good setup for our program to begin doing adaptive climbing. We've been, we've done a handful of adaptive clinics. And as we do more of these and sort of build the community with more uh, more adaptive clinics. Hopefully we'll be able to buy some more of this equipment and be able to um, just be a lot more versatile in what we need to offer. Um, but yeah, these are the, some of the additional things that you can get. And also um, Misty Mountain and Evolve makes this adaptive equipment. Um, there might be some other, other manufacturers who do it, but this is to my knowledge, the 
these are the folks, the companies that are doing it, um, I guess, the best uh, at this point, or at least um, where most adaptive programs are using their equipment. I'm just checking the chat. It is a as far as so a question, where would you get some of this equipment if one wanted to? Um, unfortunately, there's no retail stores since this equipment is made to order. Uh, there's no retail so stores that I'm aware of that carry this equipment. You actually have to go to the Misty Mountain website or the Evolve website um, and special order these things. Okay. Uh, some alternative options as far as like we got into, we, we didn't get into the complexity of the, um, of the hull system. Uh, but some more simple options, if, if someone is uh, having trouble getting up uh, a portion of the wall surface or the rock surface, you can do what's called a power belay. Uh, and the power belay, um, sometimes we all need a little boost and it's basically pulling in tension uh, with just like we usually kind of hop up and pull in slack from the rope. Um, to where like the rope is very tight. And then the power belay is when we actually sit into the rope and sit down uh, and provide a little boost to the climber and a little weight into the system to help them move up a little bit. Um, and a lot of folks, uh, that's um, when it comes to adaptive climbing, a lot of times that's if they're having issues somewhere throughout the climb, a lot of times that's all they're needing is just a little bit of a power belay, a little bit of a boost from their belayer. Um, we do have um, like um, for hearing and sight adaptations, headset radios, um, like to where someone, if you're dealing with uh, a climb that, you know, maybe um, the person is, um, need some hearing adaptation, you can actually uh, give them a headset radio and have someone on the radio kind of talking them through the climb, giving them instruction. Uh, sometimes you can set up a rope next to the climb and have uh, maybe one of the climbing instructors ascending the rope as the climber ascends and providing uh, a coach on a rope basically, uh, providing instruction and sort of step-by-step -step stuff uh, and sometimes even just encouragement uh, to those who need it. Um, there's different activities that you can do, like there's different climbing games. Um, if you're wanting to add a little bit more challenge, um, some, um, some things like it's called uh, add-on or add-a-move uh, to where you have like a participant on the wall uh, ascend to a certain, like basically do uh, three or four moves and then they add on one move and then the other climber gets on the wall and then they go through those three or four moves and then they add on a fifth or sixth move and then the next person gets on. But there's different activities that you can do. Um, sometimes um, for those new to the sport, um, like usually whenever I go climbing, uh, especially if I haven't done it in a while, even if I'm in climbing shape, I can only climb for about, oh gosh, if I'm on a rope, probably, probably maybe an hour tops before I'm completely done. Um, but if I'm not in shape or like you take a new climber, usually they can uh, do like two or three climbs tops. Uh, and then like you can get into some adding some uh, basically um, technical skills like knot tying, uh, teaching, teaching people how to set up systems and assisting with uh, the belaying of other climbers. Um, there's a bunch of different things that you can do um, 
when it comes to a day out climbing or like uh, three or four hours of climbing indoors, that doesn't mean you actually have to be on the wall climbing. You could be learning knots. Uh, you could be learning how to build anchors. You should. You could be backup belaying, providing a backup belay, or even just like having that team mentality and providing encouragement and just being um, just overall encouraging and kind of having that that uh, cheerleading attitude um, and. Also being flexible, uh, having flexible and individual goal setting. Um, I know that no matter what group that we take out climbing for a day or, um, you know, we have like indoor climbing clinics, um, you got to meet people where they're at. And um, not everybody is going to um, be at the same place whenever they start and not everyone's going to be at the same place at the end of the day. Uh, but just being flexible and just concentrate on like individual goal setting and not thinking about like everyone has to be here by the end of the day or like our goal is to have everyone, um, you know, like climb at least one route by the end of the day. Like it's okay on maybe at like the individual level, just depending on folks ability, but really, um, being flexible and having individual goals for folks. Great. Sorry, the sun is making things difficult for me to read the screen. Wait, um, Carson, is this you or is this me still? I think this one's you. Okay, sweet. Uh, so as far as um, different adapt adaptive programs that UREC offers right now. We're really trying to uh, widen our scope on what we're able to offer. Um, and here's kind of our links for the website. Um, we're, you know, offering like hand crank cycles so people can, um, you know, come and, and, you know, it's not just, um, I guess leg driven um, cardio equipment, like we have a hand crank cycle, we have hand paddles for the pool uh, for those needing like additional um, help as far as like swimming uh, when it comes to aquatics. And then also we have adaptive paddling equipment as well. Uh, and there's a whole nother clinic on adaptive paddling and the, the programs that we offer and also the equipment involved in that. Um, and all of the equipment and all of our offerings are included, um, uh, like on the links below. If, if you want to check those out and I would encourage you to check those out. Uh, but we are offering more and more programs, uh, as we progress. Uh, different regional programs offering adaptive climbing, Eastern Washington University, Epic Adventures, kind of their uh, adventure programs um, that are you know, basically our equivalent to the Aldo Rec Center and adventure programs. Um, they offer an adaptive climbing every Wednesday and that's kind of hopefully where we're trying to get to is just offering more and more uh, adaptive, um, have more and more adaptive programming, just more frequent uh, than the Right now, I think we've been doing like two adaptive climbing clinics per semester. Um, but Eastern Washington University Epic Adventures, they have a very well developed um, adaptive programs for not only climbing, but they also do paddling and also uh, cycling and stuff like that. And they're, they're, um, they're kind of showing us the way right now. There's also uh, Courageous Kids Climbing, um, a regional um, adaptive kids climbing program um, and also Wild Walls um, is kind of a um, a facility up in Spokane, climbing facility up in Spokane that a lot of the programs that we're going to talk about in the next slide use as a facility um, for adaptive climbing. 
Alrighty. Uh, in addition to adaptive climbing opportunities, there's some other adaptive recreation opportunities available as well. Um, community centers and parks and recreation offices um, often have uh, listed opportunities for events and and uh, opportunities, regular or special, um, regular programming or special programming, like infrequent, that's what I mean. Um, uh, other organizations include um, Parasports Spokane, which offers a number of sports in that area, and Adaptive Adventures um, actually has a mobile program, so they go around the country um, and have different kinds of equipment for different kinds of uh, adaptive sport opportunities as well. Um, so if you're interested, you might check those out. And this just, I would like as adaptive, not only adaptive climbing and adaptive sports get more popular, just keep checking back on your community centers and parks and rec offices. Uh, keep checking back, back and because it's only going to grow and only going to get more frequent. And uh, so keep checking those uh, regional websites and offices and uh, feel free to give them a call. Um, but yeah, uh, right now, uh, that's basically our presentation. Um, right now, we're just kind of open things up for questions and questions that folks have. Sure thing. Thank you so much, Matt and Carson. We do have a question. Uh, Kenny says he was going to ask, do you guys have just indoor or do you offer outdoor climbing exercises for people to join? Where would you say is the easiest place to start learning to climb? And what places have you guys climbed that you enjoyed the most? Uh, right now, we are only offering indoor adaptive climbing clinics. Uh, one nice thing or like one very convenient thing about uh, indoor climbing is it's a space that we can control. Um, it allows for at least the, the best access um, for those who uh, utilize um, wheelchairs um, and uh, different types of, of uh, mobility like it's really easy to uh, for those folks who, to gain access and to get into the not only get in the facility but get right up to the wall um, outside um, like we're kind of um, at the mercy of the environment um, a lot of there's a lot of climbing areas that are uh, really challenging to get to uh, if you uh, even if you don't like utilize a wheelchair or something like that uh, they're difficult to hike to right now I would say the the place that we would probably most likely utilize is uh, Granite Point it has um, a decent trail to get to the base of the crag. Like once we would get to the base of the crag, it's fairly level. Uh, but there's a couple of places where we would actually uh, need to uh, carry folks and, and their equipment that they needed um, through some of the, like there's some like places like rock walls where you would have to um, actually sort of scramble up. Um, so right now we're, only offer indoor, uh, but we're hoping to, once we get more or uh, staff, staffing skills like um, our regular like student staff skills get to the level and also like our professional staff skills grow, uh, we're hopefully, um, you know, be able to take it outside. As far as, um, favorite places to climb. Uh, I've spent so much time at Granite Point, uh, which is only about a 25, 30 minute drive from the Pullman campus. Um, each time I go there, uh, depending on the light and the weather and what's going on that day, it's always a really awesome view um, from Granite Point. Um, 
like the view along the Snake River is I still haven't gotten um, desensitized to that yet. And I've been in the area for about nine years. It's it's an awesome place to climb and it's turned into a favorite place to, to climb for me. And it's convenient. Uh, it's only 25, 30 minute drive away. Um, Carson, uh, what is, what's your favorite area to climb? Granite Point's also my favorite. Um, like I said, I'm new to the climbing outdoors. So like every time I've gone sport climbing outside, I've been at Granite Point. Uh, one of the things I really like about it is that um, there's, you know, a number of different difficulty levels on the routes. So, you know, one day I'm able to like do one thing and another I'm able to, you know, level up. I don't get bored there um, because there's, there's a variety of routes. Yeah. And if you're willing to make the drive post falls, uh, Quinlan Park is a great, like has, first of all, like a lot more climbing routes, uh, but also is just a beautiful area, uh, really heavily forested. Um, and, um, you know, I've definitely made the trip there just to like do a day of hiking. Um, but it's a really beautiful park and a lot of, a lot of different climbing. Um, so I would say, yeah, just to add that one in. Awesome. Well, thank you so much.